that you can have a user saying, when I do this, and by I they mean me as a lion, or they would say, when I go to the coach at the end of the day, and they're talking about I as a student, uh, and they can have them in the same sentence, and everyone hearing them can understand it, it's not confusing, everyone seems to negotiate it very well. So what I'm getting at there is I think we've already got quite well-rounded languages of play and presents and so on, that might cover this area more effectively than just talking about the digital, real or virtual. And again, that's a point where just talking in terms of the technology, um, it's but it's not so useful. It, it pushes us down this real and virtual split when perhaps we actually need to be a little bit more human about the whole thing. So anyway, that, um, all that waffle to one side. Let's, uh, I'm not quite sure why this is skipping around so much, but let's just move it back to where we are. So analysing scapes. What what I'm going to do is really for each, with each of these mobile learning experiences, I just want to walk through a very top level analysis of each of them. Um, and I'm going to look at the topological semiotic and rhetorical scapes within each and ask um, how is it how's the space represented what identities are being made available to the participants and what goals are offered or more simply you know where who and why um, so if we go back to the Fort Solosa idea this is the um, military encampment the kind of restored World War II venue and look at the activity that people are being asked to engage with um, I should say that this is rather unfair uh, and that if I was the author of this, I'd probably feel a bit miffed because this wasn't the purpose of the research. I'm using this because it's been published and, and talked about. Um, I'm using it to illustrate the limitations of my framework rather than trying to say this is good or bad because the purpose of this was very different. And from speaking to teachers and researchers, the thoughts of the thoughts to also work achieve those, those aims. Um, Look, for our purposes now, let's sp split it up into these three areas and, and see where that gets us. So from a purely external reality perspective, you've got um, what makes up that place. So the beach I mentioned earlier, the rainforest, the tr uh, trees, the, uh, the solid concrete buildings and tunnels that make up the camp. Um, from a semiotic point of view, the place of the museum, you know, that's how it's labelled and talked about. Um, there are probably other ways of looking at it, but let's just stick with that for the moment. Um, the people involved are students, that's their role, they're not um, daughters or sons, particularly they're students in this case, and they have a goal which is to complete their assignment to go around and finish all the tasks. Looked at from a rhetorical perspective, looked at from a kind of imaginative and narrative perspective, the location is not so much a museum as it is a military camp. It's a place where soldiers lived and fought, it's a place where guns were rotated hurriedly to, ro to point away from the sea and back into the island. Um, and so the location is figured quite differently, or at least if you're engaging if you're engaging with the narrative offered by the mobile experience, then it becomes a different kind of place. But the identity of the people in there doesn't change. The students are still students are being asked to do student tasks, they're being asked to do things that are very explicitly figured as learning, um, and learning for students, not learning for military people, they're not pretending to be soldiers or inhabitants or, or invaders um, or spectators, they're still students. And their goal hasn't changed. Um, so what that suggests to me, I mean, we've seen there that all the three layers are very tightly coupled, there's no explicit reconfiguration of what you're being asked to do or who you're being asked to be. There is a slight difference in the way that the buildings are figured. Um, but if you go to a museum like this, you are to an extent being asked, I think, to imagine what it was like all those years ago. Um, I think the key thing for me is that the triggers for act activity aren't embedded in this rhetorical scape, that you're not being asked to do something by, say, a colonel um, in the army. You're not being asked to respond to something that they um, a communicate from the Japanese. Your trigger for activity is located squarely within the semiotic scape. So that's a very, very top level view of the Fort Silosa activity. Let's have a look at the Singapore Zoo. So looking at the same um, three, three dimensions. Um, the, the topology of the zoo is configured around the needs of the habitats of, of, the, of the animals. There are very strictly demarcated boundaries. Um, there's a path. The, the, the physicality of the space is dictated. Um, well, it, it maps extremely tightly to um, its purpose, as you would expect. It's a zoo, uh, and so this, the, the kind of within the semiotic scape, the unit of analysis for the location would be the habitat, that's how it's figured on the maps, and that's, how, that's where the signs point to, that's where people give directions from, there's the monkey house or 
the lion enclosure or the lizard house, wherever. The people taking part in the Singapore Zoo um, were students. Again, they were doing a school task. So from a semiotic perspective, they, they're school learners uh, and they have to complete an assignment. But the big difference here with the previous one is that there's a, um, a much more fleshed out rhetorical layer that the habitats of the animals in the semiotic location are theirs. We are students, we have real houses, they are animals, they live here. When the students take on the identity of animals rather than students, um, these habitats become ours. You know, or my, I'm looking for my sun bear habitat, so I'm trying to avoid his, which is a crocodile habitat. But the, the orientation towards these habitats changes quite drastically. And the goals change as a result. The, the, um, well, I suppose it's arguable whether the identity leads to goals or the goals change your identity, but you can see that the animals have a different job to do than the students. There's not much point in students avoiding the predators and returning home, and the animals don't need to complete any homework. So there's a real clear split there between the semiotic and the rhetorical scapes. Um, but again, it's, it's, that I think is something that the teachers were very proud of. They, they'd seen the, the potential to create something they thought of as a game, and they were very excited at the fact that they were asking students to do something completely different. But if you look at the analysis on this framework, at least, you can see it's not actually as different as all that. That the logic of the zoo, the kind of the inescapable fun function of the habitat, actually shapes everything. So the hotspots, the the GPS regions that students are being asked to move into, um, corresponded very very tightly to the real life habitats as it were. Now this is important because these boundaries in the rhetorical scape are not physically real. They don't they didn't have to be there. They could have been somewhere else. And so what I'm suggesting is that an analyzing it in this way would allow the, the designers to see that they've made certain assumptions about the space that were maybe inherited from how it's normally used, but don't necessarily have to exist. So it looks it looks very, very different at first glance at first uh, glance. But actually, thinking about it, you're really still less in the zoo shape how things work. Looking at the savannah example, um, from a, top a topological perspective, it's about as simple as you can get. There's a big flat playing field on this level. It's not even a playing field. It's just an open level space. Looked at from a semiotic point of view, it's called a playing field. It's, fun it's function is for school students to come play, play games on it. In this case, the student's role was to test, test the game. Um, They've been handed the thing by researchers, and, and their job was to follow the game. On the rhetorical scape, almost everything is different. The location is, is the savanna, it's no longer a playing field. The students are no longer students, they're lions. Uh, and their goal is not far from helping a bunch of researchers try something new, and their goal is to survive and eat things. Um, and so, almost on every level, you can see it's very much richer. Um, so, there's, I mean, I'm suggesting there's actually little or no continuity between the way you experience this area without the mobile experience, without looking at this PDA, and the way you experience it with the PDA. Um, rather than augmenting it and extending what you've got, um, you're actually replacing it wholesale. You've got a new s system. Um, you've got a very rich set of kind of conditional relationships. You've got a bunch of um, things that will happen if other things happen first. Um, and that's noticeably absent, I'd say, from the previous two things, the one that I was involved in designing and the one that I wasn't. Um, the only thing that the scapes have in common is the fact that in both the lions, in both the semiotic and rhetorical scapes, um, participants are acting as learners. That when they're students, they're learners, and when they're lions, they're learning how to, how to be lions. So this mark, this difference is, is more marked, I think, if you look at this table here, comparing them all. Um, I'm suggesting that the Fort Siloso and the Singapore Zoo examples are very, very tightly coupled to the um, the way the landscape they're in is used anyway, that the semiotic scape is to the fore, whereas in Savannah they've replaced it wholesale with a much richer rhetorical scape. Um, the, the linking um, between these scapes in terms of location, identity and goals is very, very high across the board in Fort Siloso, that if you turned up to this place as a student with a certain set of goals, and before you turned your, your MacBook on, they haven't really changed afterwards. Um, in the Singapore Zoo, at least, although the location is very, very um, 
consistent across the three levels, the identity and goals change. Um, and of course, with, with the third example, with the savannas, there's no continuity at all, really, between the goals and purpose and, and uh, where the space is, is, is represented um, with or without the device. So what does this give us? Uh, it seems like perhaps it's rather a hammer to crack a nut, or perhaps it's a bit unfair to compare things that aren't intended to be the same anyway. What's interesting in it for me is that it first of all helps us to, just the act of using it at all helps us to distinguish between the design of an activity and the implementation of an activity. And that's where I started from. So for me, this is a useful design tool, if nothing else. Um, it helps us think about the relationship between the physical space and the narrative that we're asking people to take part in. So although there are some examples where people do this very, very well, for example, the frequency um, example from Vark.org that was linked earlier, um, does this very well, I think, in terms of Amsterdam or the, um, Jeff, I don't know if you can remember the uh, fur trading Vark project, that, that was very tightly coupled to the maps and locations of the, uh, of, um, 1400s, 1500s, New Amsterdam and Amsterdam, but in lots, of, in lots of other places the space tends to dictate what people do. And the value of that really for me is that it helps designers to reflect on how their um, assumptions about space are informing their design. And perhaps if you can make those things explicit, perhaps it's easier to decide whether you want to do that on purpose or not. Uh, and for me the third thing that this framework gives us is that it gives us permission to recognize more complex ways of being that you don't need to say me in the virtual space or me in the real space but you can start to recognize as kind of a continuity of pretense that there are different ways of engaging with um, the different roles that people are um, offered so there's two big questions really that I'd like to throw open for discussion um, and I'm you know I'm looking forward to engaging with this on the Google group later on and on the wiki and of course personally if you want to email me later. First of all, um, I think it's really clear that when, although it's very easy to talk about M learning as though it's a generic single thing, it's very easy to focus on the common analysis of um, the issues we all have with implementation and choosing technology and so on. Um, I think it's important to recognise that some mobile learning apps are really just trying to replace a worksheet to make something more effective and some are approaching games that they're um, described as games or they really are games um, and there are degrees of pretense, degrees of narrative, degrees of identities that um, exist in different levels across these different mobile learning examples so they're not all the same in short. So I suggest, um, I mean my, my, my feeling is that this framework isn't really that useful unless you're looking at designing something that is a game or that involves some element of role playing or some element of engaging in make-believe. Personally, I think that the fact that these location-based technologies offer us the chance to do that um, means that we ought to try and use them to their full extent and that I think that that would probably offer richer learning experiences than walking around picking things off on a touch screen rather than on a photocopy piece of paper. Um, but that depends very much on your curricular perspective, the opportunities you have for pedagogy, innovation and the kind of assumptions that you're making. Um, and, and so I'm certainly not, not saying that anyone else's use is inappropriate or less good some, somehow. But for, for me, the tension here is really about the identity that you're asking people to take on or not. And the second area, um, this, the second area that I'm interested in is how far is it important to redraw space? How far is it important to make use of GPS technology, location-based technology, when looking at mobile learning and looking at designing activities? For me, the really exciting thing about all this is the fact that you get to um, decide where boundaries are in, in a way that you don't in the in the physical world. Um, on the other hand, again, that's not always what people what people are after. It may not fit your learning goals. I mean, I'm looking forward to discussing these in a second, but I think these are for me the real fault fault lines um, when I'm trying to sort mobile learning projects. When I'm trying to think about what I'd like to design myself in my own work, um, these are the areas that I'm looking at. And I think the bottom line is really do you want to do something by accident or do you want to do something on purpose? And having a framework like this helps you be sure that whatever it is you're doing, you're doing it in the full knowledge that you're doing it rather than doing it because the technology helps you to do it. And so that is me for the time being. Thanks very much for listening to me go on. I'm looking forward to your contributions. If you'd like to 
um, email me or argue with me or just ask for references later, then um, richard at richardsandford.net is the best email to contact me on.